actually sound better this week than I did last week. So, uh, anyway. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody. It's good to see that we have some visitors with us, and we're excited about that, and I uh, hope that you will come back when uh, you are able to. Let me just tell you one quick thing about those LTC t-shirts. They fe feature artwork done by Parker Wallace, our very own Parker Wallace. And so uh, that gives you, gives, gives you a little bit of incentive, even if you don't ever wear t-shirts, okay? Uh, you might want one just for posterity's sake, because one day Parker will be a famous artist or something like that. And he'll say, hey, I got a shirt that has one of his original works on it. So there is a statement that Jesus made that is so plain, and yet to some, it's so controversial. In fact, so controversial is it that you rarely hear it referred to by well-known preachers, whether it be in their churches, or on the TV, or in the, on the radio, or in the books that they write. They, they, they try to stay away from it. And if they do ever happen to mention it, well, they feel it's necessary to offer some sort of an explanation that goes completely against what the word clearly says he said and tries to change the meaning around a little bit. Uh, the words that we're talking about that Jesus spoke are the words found in Mark 16, verse 16, where Jesus says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now some people, when you immediately bring up Mark 15, 16, 16, the first thing that pops out of their mouth is, yeah, but did you see what it says a couple of verses earlier? It says, uh, there's a little, little tiny print there that says, the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20, which includes verse 16. So therefore, you can't really make a big deal about Mark 16, 16, because the earliest and other ancient witnesses aren't real sure that it should even be in the Bible. Granted, in, more, in our more modern versions, that uh, does appear, that the earliest and uh, other ancient manuscripts and sources don't have these verses. But at the same time, what I would say to those people is that obviously the people translating, the scholars translating the version of the Bible felt that there was enough textual evidence so as to include it in the actual text of the Bible. In other words, they didn't include it as a footnote and they didn't include it by, well, they didn't deal with it by excluding it either. So, in some cases, you'll see where a verse here and there are, uh, you know, it goes from verse, I don't know, 36 to verse 38, and you look down in the footnotes and you see verse 37. They didn't do that with, this, with these verses. They included them in the actual text because there's evidently enough evidence to do so. Now, to illustrate the lengths that man will go to, to try to explain away this verse, let's take a look at four different views of this verse as taught by men. And then we'll contrast those views with uh, the view uh, that is stated by Jesus very plainly and is supported by his apostles in their teaching and their preaching. The first view is one that is held by <coughs> excuse me. The first view is one that is held by those who do not profess to be Christians. But for the purposes of our lesson, we need to take a look at it and consider it. In essence, what they would say is that Mark 16, 16 really says, He who believes and is baptized will not be saved. Now there are two separate groups that would hold to this view. One group would be atheists. 
And, by, and in the atheist group, I would include people who would classify themselves as quote-unquote agnostics, those who aren't sure. But uh, they, they don't really believe in God. They don't believe in heaven or hell. Uh, they don't believe in salvation of any kind. So because they don't believe in salvation of any kind, and because of that they don't believe that there's a heaven and a hell, and, uh, and, and that there's really any thing to be saved from, well, they just would say, hey, he who believes and is baptized is not going to be saved because there's no such thing as salvation anyway. Another group that would hold to this teaching, or this interpretation, I should say, would be Jews, Muslims, Hindus, etc. Now, they may believe in God, as the Jews do, or in God's plural as Hindus and so forth. Uh, but, uh, but they don't believe that salvation is to be found in Jesus, nor is salvation found in obedience to the word of Jesus. And that to believe and or be baptized is actually contrary to the will of God. Now, but those who would accept Jesus' authority and the authority of his apostles would reject such a view. They would reject such a view because there is a God who offers salvation, contrary to the views of, uh, of atheists and agnostics, etc. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, <coughs> excuse me, Paul writes these words. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So contrary to the views of atheists and so forth, there is a God who offers salvation, who wants us to accept his offer of salvation. But not only that, we also know that salvation does come only through Jesus. If we continue in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, uh, or verses 5 and 6, excuse me. Who, uh, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the, men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. Another passage would be such as uh, John 14, verse 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, quite honestly, I would doubt very seriously that anyone here this morning actually holds this view. There are some people who do. Now, I understand that. And I, and, and I understand that they do. But it only begins to illustrate how some are willing to deny the clear, plain statement of Jesus. But consider a second view. He who does not believe and is not baptized will be saved. This view is held, <coughs> excuse me, this view is held by universalists. Universalists believe that, well, God's going to save everybody eventually anyway. That, 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 that God is not going to send anybody to hell. That God is going to save everybody. Everybody is going to be in heaven. And to support their view, they will isolate some verses. Actually, what they'll do is they'll isolate parts of verses. Parts of verses such as uh, 1 Timothy 2, verse 6, that we just read a few moments ago, it, where it says, he gave, Who gave himself as a ransom for all men. So therefore, if Jesus is a ransom for all men, all men are going to be in heaven. And by men, I don't mean the male gender. I mean mankind, okay? That's how, that's the word that's finished by Paul in 1 Timothy. Um, they also might use a passage just such as 1 John 4, or actually part of that passage. The last part of that verse says, God is love. And oh, if God is loved, then God is not going to send anybody to an eternity of pain that is far above and beyond anything that we can even begin to imagine. A God who is loved is not going to 
to want anyone to be separated from him for all of eternity. And so therefore, a God who is love is not going to send anybody to hell. But those who know the teachings of Christ and of Paul reject this view. Jesus, Jesus himself said there are few that would be saved. Mark, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many find it, enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. And then there's also what Paul writes in Ephesians 5, verses 5 and 6. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. In other words, if we don't obey God, if we don't do things the way God tells us to do things, the way the Word of God tells us to live our lives, then the wrath of God is coming. If the wrath of God comes, then you know, it, it's going to happen. So Paul warned there are those who will not be saved, some who would face the wrath of God. Now most Bible-believing, professing Christians would never treat Mark 16, 16, the way these first two views do. But as we consider two more verses, uh, versions, I guess, or views, we might say interpretations, I might start hitting a little closer to home. And please understand that as I do this, I do it with the desire to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4:15. And it's my prayer that your love for the truth is such that you're willing to seriously consider the discussion that follows. The third view, then, is a view that says, He who does not believe and is baptized will be saved. This view is held by most who would practice infant baptism. Um, by baptizing, actually what they're doing is sprinkling, not immersing in most cases, uh, infants who are incapable of faith. And they want us to believe that faith is not essential to salvation. That you don't have to believe anything. You don't have to know anything. It's not essential. And they might try to get around this whole thing about having to have faith by uh, making the statement that God imparts, miraculously imparts, saving faith to the infant, who is then sprinkled or, or has water poured over them, etc. In some instances, they do immerse. Strangely enough, one uh, group that practices infant baptism is the Greek Orthodox Church. You know what they do? They immerse. I think the Greeks know a little bit about what Koine Greek says here. That it, baptism is not a sprinkling, it's not a pouring, it's immersing. But anyway, that's another story for another time. Uh, by sprinkling and pouring instead of immersion, though, they also indicate that Jesus didn't mean what he said. Which is the reason why baptized is in quotation marks up here on the, on the PowerPoint. <clears throat> Excuse me. But speaking the truth in love, it must be pointed out. Number one, that faith is a necessary prerequisite to baptism. Uh, Acts 8, 35 through 38, the Ethiopian eunuch, Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water, why shouldn't I be baptized? Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized them. So clearly faith is a necessary prerequisite for baptism. It's a necessary prerequisite for salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10, Paul says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So it must be pointed out that faith is a necessary prerequisite for baptism. It's a necessary prerequisite for salvation. 
But we also must point out that sprinkling or pouring is not Bible baptism. We've heard probably many times the Greek word used in the Bible, baptizo, and it means to immerse. If the people who were translating the King James Version of the Bible back in uh, 1611, if they had translated the word baptizo instead of transliterated it, simply took the Greek word and put it in English letters, we wouldn't have any of this problem. We wouldn't have anybody sprinkling or pouring. The problem was that sprinkling and pouring was already an acceptable form, if you will, of baptism in 1611. So if they had translated this word, then they might have gotten into trouble with the church. The Catholic church, that is. And because of that, they invented a new English word, baptism. Instead of translating the Greek word into English, which would have been immersed. Uh, for example, the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, 38, we just read it a few moments ago. Philip and the eunuch both went down into the water and Philip baptized him. See, spring, uh, that is why baptism in the Bible is described as a burial in passages such as Romans 6, 3 and 4 and Colossians 2, verse 12. Uh, sprinkler and pouring was substituted in the place of baptism, immersion, <coughs> excuse me, hundreds of years after Christ and his apostles. But by keeping the tradition of men, uh, and, <coughs> excuse me, I thought I would sound better today, maybe not. <coughs> by keeping the tradition of men, by sprinkling or pouring, we fail to keep the command of God by uh, baptizing, by immersing. Uh, Jesus condemned the Pharisees and other religious leaders in Matthew chapter 15, verses 3 through 9, for letting go of the commands of God in order to maintain their traditions. It must also be pointed out, not only that faith is a necessary prerequisite for baptism and for salvation, that sprinkling or pouring is not Bible baptism. It must also be pointed out, speaking the truth in love, that infant baptism is without scriptural precedence. There is no command or example of infant baptism found in the Bible. As someone says, wait a second, preacher. What about when you read about how whole households were baptized? Certainly that would include infants. No, not exactly. Not specifically. Uh, not when you can when you put those accounts with other accounts to, to synthesize what baptism was about. You find out that you know faith is necessary and infants aren't capable of faith. And so therefore, they uh, they were not part of the baptized, uh, baptized when whole households were baptized. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm confident very confident that those who hold the, to the view of sprinkling infants are honest and sincere. But despite their honest sincerity, they're just as guilty of twisting the scriptures as the atheists, as unbelieving Jews and any other uh, Muslims, Hindus, etc. And the Universalists. There's another view sincerely held by many, though, that takes it a little bit, a little different approach. He who believes and is not baptized will be saved. This view is held by those who believe in salvation by faith only, or by faith alone. Uh, this is, this, what this says is one is saved before baptism. They are saved by faith and faith only. Uh, nothing else is necessary. Now later on down the road, you might get baptized because you were saved. You might be baptized to join a church. You might be baptized as an outward expression of the fact that you've already been saved, of the, that inward grace. But that baptism for the purpose of having your sins forgiven, being a part of the salvation experience, they would say, no, 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 no. That's, that's, that's not the way that it works at all. 
to salvation, essentially is what they're saying. This view is held by... <coughs> by asking Jesus into my heart by saying the sinner's prayer. They might be somewhat shocked to find out that the sinner's prayer does not appear anywhere in the Bible. It doesn't. It's not there. And so, uh, so it, it, it's, it's a twisting of scriptures. See, Jesus and his apostles and his follow their followers clearly taught differently. They clearly taught that faith alone cannot save. That's something that Jesus uh, teaches in Matthew 7, 21 and Luke 6, 46, where Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So clearly obedience is something that Jesus placed a very high premium on. You're not just going to get into heaven if you call Jesus Lord and have accepted him, quote unquote, as Lord. But if you truly accept him as Lord, you're going to do what he tells you to do. And that's, it. that's the important thing. And it was also taught by his apostles and followers. As it says in Romans 6, verses 17 and 18. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Uh, James 2, 14 through 26. Incidentally, in verse 24 of James 2, that is the only time in the entire New Testament that the words faith alone appear right next to each other. In that, in that, in that phrase, faith alone. And you know what James says? He says, man is saved by what he does and not by faith alone. 1 Peter 1, 22, 1 John 2, 3 through 5 says, But thanks be to God that through, though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching which, to which you were entrusted. You've been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So uh, they clearly teach that faith alone cannot save. They clearly teach baptism is essential to salvation. According to Jesus, and I'm going to machine gun some verses out at you. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Mark 16, 16, the verse we've been looking at. John 3, verse 5. Jesus speaks of being born of water and the Spirit. Baptism is essential to salvation according to his apostles. Look at Acts 2, 38. Acts 22, 16. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Colossians 2, 12 and 13. First uh, uh, Peter 3, 21. Titus 3, 5. Other passages as well could be cited. Again, I believe that those who hold this view, including personal friends of mine, are sincere and are not knowingly twisting the word of, words of God, words of Jesus. Yet I cannot help but think about such people, maybe as similar to how Paul felt about the Jews, the Israelites. If you look at Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, Paul says, Brothers, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Well, this leads us to a fifth and final view, the one that I believe that we are compelled to accept, and that is, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Does that sound familiar? It should, because this view takes the words of Jesus at face value. That's what he says, and what's, that's what he means. Uh, no explanation is necessary. Uh, 
We have the evidence that says it's authentic, that Jesus did say these words, that uh, Mark does record accurately in verse in chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. Uh, we are compelled to understand that what's taught in Mark, Mark 16, 16 agrees with what's taught in other passages. No explanation is necessary. Jesus says what he means, and he means what he says. Now, we've already seen the, previously the Bible teaches that one must have faith, that one must believe. Acts 8, 36 and 37. We've already seen already that one must be baptized for the forgiveness of sins to enjoy that forgiveness of sins. Acts 2, 38. Acts 22, 16. So which of the five views of Mark 16, 16 do you hold to? He who believes and is baptized will not be saved. He who does not believe and is not baptized will be saved. He who does not believe and is baptized will be saved. He who believes and is not baptized will be saved. Or he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Which of those five views do you hold to? I mean, it should be clear that there's only one view which is in harmony with Jesus' words. There's only one view that doesn't involve tampering with the clear statement of Jesus. But perhaps more importantly, with which of these views is your life consistent? You see, one may hold intellectually to the fifth view, and yet act as though they believe the second view. How do they do that? By never confessing faith in Christ and being baptized. One can intellectually hold to the fifth view, but act as though they believe the third view. How? Though they may have been baptized, they are not living the life of faith required of one who truly is in Jesus Christ. One may hold intellectually to the fifth view, but act as though they believe the fourth view to be true. How? For while believing in Jesus, they've never submitted to being baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Not because their sins were already forgiven when they believed, but because that's where their sins are washed away. Acts 22:16. Only those who have come to Jesus in faith and have acted in harmony with his teachings can have the assurance of salvation. The words of the Bible are clear. Acts 2.38, Peter says to the people on the day of Pentecost who are cut to the heart by, his, by their sins, he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Words are clear in Acts 22, 16, when, when Paul is recounting his salvation experience with Ananias. And Ananias tells him, and now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Friend, can I ask, what is it that you're waiting for? If you've never been immersed in the watery grave of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, why not? There's no downside to it. Your sins are washed away. You'll have an eternal home that is an eternity that is far above and beyond any joy that you can possibly imagine. As compared to the alternative of an eternity with more pain than you can possibly begin to imagine. Jesus is tenderly calling to you this morning. Will you answer? Will you ignore him? We can help you in some way through a public response. A baptism, a prayer, or any other need that you might have. Why don't you come to the front now as we stand and sing together?